you know, after years of sitting down and interviewing and studying, you know, successful entrepreneurs and what they do, there, there is one thing that sets successful entrepreneurs away from the failures. I mean, really, there's no other way to call it. And that is a clarity of vision, right? The ability to say what you do in three sentences or less is absolutely mission critical. Welcome to Increase the Dosage. This is the show that strips away the facade of fake entrepreneurship. It removes the glamour, comes from the trenches, and provides the naked conversations, war stories, lessons learned, and the tools and tricks used by the successful entrepreneurs who overcame their challenges to achieve new growth so that you can too. Now, for your weekly shot of entrepreneurial adrenaline, here is your host, serial entrepreneur and venture catalyst, Chris J. Snook. Welcome back, everybody. Chris J. Snook here for another episode of Increase the Dosage. Today, I am joined by my new friend, Amy Cosper, who I'm super excited to discuss because she is at a front row seat to entrepreneurship that only a handful of people can say they had as the former editor and chief of Entrepreneur Magazine for over a decade, and uh, also with her current work that she's doing, which we'll get into a little bit today. But without further ado, I'm gonna let her introduce herself and what she thinks relevant about uh, her story. We're getting into the highs, the lows, and everything in between. Welcome to the show, Amy Cosper. Thank you, Chris. It's really nice to be here. It's nice to meet you. I'm super happy to have you in my cadre of network cool people. Cadre is a big word for me. I know, it's, it's French. I'm going to go look that up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just nice to be here. And I'm always happy to talk on the topic of entrepreneurship. My, my background is 100% media from writing about satellite launch vehicles to uh, really sort of chasing the stories globally about the, the cultural and economic impact of creating entrepreneurial ecosystems. So it is a, my pleasure to be here with you today. Well, excellent. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about bloody stuff because that's what's cool. <laughs> about this show. But we're going to start off with, um, you know, in the vernacular. So Startup Drugs is is the community. Increase the Dosage is the podcast that supports that community. And, and, and you know that. But for those who are new time listeners, that's the uh, that's the backstory here. And, and Drugs is with a Z. And, and the idea is that if starting up uh, is your drug of choice, then we uh, want to be your support group because, as we all know, anyone who's been an entrepreneur uh, or been around them, we need help sometimes. And and, uh, and and it isn't as glamorous as as maybe the media the last several years has made it seem, but it is a way of life that has a deep sense of meaning for those who are in it and has a deep impact on the ecosystems that benefit from it, as you've well witnessed. So, again, we welcome you to the show. Tell, tell us what the maybe less secure, less uh, certain in her own humanhood, Amy Cosper, teenage version, would look back on the last uh, couple of years and say, wow, you know, what are the highs? Like, what did you do that that you're proud of? And what did you do that, you know, that, that kind of surprised you? And tell us about some of those those high points. I mean, you know, everything I've done in my life from even like the early days of my career, traveling all over the world and being a reporter covering satellite technology was a high point. It was weird. It was not, I I studied art history and Italian. So satellite launch vehicles were not in my natural trajectory, so to speak. (laughs) Uh, But, but every, every time I've gotten to be a part of impacting some sort of culture or some sort of movement, like the entrepreneurial movement globally, that is to me a high point. And I want to go back to something you said, Chris, if I if you don't mind. Oh, of course. It's your show today. Yeah. So the the whole thing, and I'm I'm guilty and I'm a part of this problem, but the whole idea and the whole subculture of presenting entrepreneurship as this glamorous, you know, suddenly you make yourself into a, the CEO of a billion dollar, you know, company is is a lie, <laughs> right? Like most entrepreneurs are bootstrapping, they are self-funding, they are scrapping their way out of a hole almost every single day. And I just want to make that really clear. Like it's fun and you get to create and you get to make your own lab for your ideas, Um, but it is a hard path. And I I know that because I've seen it. Now the media, of which I am a part, um, makes it look like this is some sort of, you know, Hollywood-esque glamorous profession, but um, 
there are very hard days. There are rewarding days, but there are very challenging times. So I just wanted to. No, I think I think it's a. I think it's really. Let's let's go down that thread a little bit, and, and you can weave in some highs too. Because we'll we'll kind of go down that thread um, in the first ten minutes here, because I think that's really what most people are just nodding their heads as they listen to that, that have been in the you know game, as I call it, for any length of time. And, you know, if we analogize it to other things that are worth noting, whether it's professional sports or dance or, you know, the arts or whatever, we, as humans, it's our nature to, to look at something that is rare and want to normalize it from an access standpoint. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that because inherently none of us would try if we didn't think it was possible for us. And yet there's a fine line of pattern recognition that again, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we need to change anything because I think the market always sorts things out. That's a bias I have. It, it doesn't mean it's right, but you know, living through a couple of downturns, you know, my first yeah. start was in 99. So I felt the Oh one hit, you know, I barely cut out of that and Oh eight felt that hit. And so by now I kind of look at it and I, I don't, you know, have this weird idea of what's going on. We're kind of in the longest cycle of uptick we've ever had. And so the notion that you're an entrepreneur today isn't wrong, but you don't really know until, you know, 12, 18 months from now, whenever this next one kind of goes down and we see who's left. And so, you know, it's not about glamorizing. It's not about fear mongering, right? It's, it's right. just kind of understanding the game you're playing, like just understand what it is and then find a way to, stay in it if it's for you. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the, the, you know, after years of sitting down and interviewing and studying, you know, successful entrepreneurs and what they do, there, there is one thing that sets successful entrepreneurs away from the failures. I mean, really, there's no other way to call it. And that is a clarity of vision, right? The ability to say what you do in three sentences or less is absolutely mission critical. Right. If you get lost in the gobbledygook, which a lot of tech entrepreneurs do, and you, 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 in order to pitch and to raise and to tell your story, you have to be able to tell it with clarity. And I am telling you, your story as an entrepreneur is absolutely your greatest asset, no matter what you're doing, raising capital, trying to recruit, whatever it is. And that that's just a little like sidebar of you know my experience with years and years of entrepreneurs who are successful and some who have failed. I agree with you, but I'm going to challenge you because I want to see how you respond to this too. Because those things are for sure like you got to be able to distill it in three sentences. You got to have a vision. But I would I would also challenge that assumption to some degree or let you expand on it because being an entrepreneur isn't about the company. It's part of the thing that makes you tick. And what I mean by that is like, I, you know, I relate a lot of things to football because it's the only other thing I really did in my life that I was as passionate about as building businesses, right? It doesn't mean it, but hopefully people can extrapolate in, in something they understand that's like this. You're not a football player if you're focused on whether or not you are ready for one specific game or you played one game. Like if you played one game, that doesn't make you a football player. That makes you someone who participated in one game. And the reason why I say that is because you accept certain things by playing any sport, but you know, football, which is a high impact collision type sport, you accept that on any given down, you could die. Mm -hmm. Most likely on any given season, you're going to get injured. And depending on what that injury is, it may put you out for a while. You may need a surgery, or it just may be a real pain in your ass that you feel when you're 45. Right. But the, the bottom line is you kind of accept that. And the reason why you accept that is the rush that you get off of hitting someone in the mouth with your face. <laughs> and hearing them exhale ugh, feels good in a sick, fun sort of way, right? That's what you play for. <laughs> okay, keep going. And so as an entrepreneur, I'm saying that, you know, building something, creating something from nothing, selling something, providing a value in a gap that exists and just like that either turns you on or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And if it does, you may be in a vehicle right now called your current company, your current pitch, your current thing. But if that vehicle got exploded tomorrow, a real entrepreneur is going to have another one the next day. That's correct. One of the, the other observations, and I appreciate your challenge. I have never hit anyone in the head and heard them <laughs> feel like that. I just lost half the audience because they think this guy is sick in the head. Yeah. 
Football players understand. <laughs> I never wanted to hurt someone, but there is something fun about mono a mono, and and you know, and sometimes you you accept that you might be the person gasping for air. Right, right? So. but it's a strategy, right? Like it's all about strategy, and like a great football player, entrepreneurs see things other people do not see. They say they see an impossible path that nobody else would see because they are curious and because they have that fire in the belly for chasing down something that has not ever been thought of or done before. And I like to your, to your point, like the sports analogy is very relevant. I, I am a motorcycle rider, right? Mm. I like to I like BMW, whatever. Like I just, I like them. I've crashed a few times. And the one thing I have learned on a motorcycle is that you go where you look just like an entrepreneurship, right? Mm. If you look at the yep. pothole or you look at the big guy who's going to come tackle you, guess what's going to happen? You're going to hit the pothole. You're going to eat pavement or you're going to eat somebody's face with your head or they're going to eat your head in football. I don't, I've never been. No, it, it, it's a perfect analogy. Like I won't ride a motorcycle, right? But I, but it doesn't mean because I don't like risk. It's just everybody applies it differently. So I love the motorcycle analogy. Keep going with it because there's a whole group of people that do that. Right. And everyone listening to this by now has extrapolated, like, what's the thing you do that other people think is crazy? I mean, there's a lot of things that I do that people think are crazy, but there is, you know, a known the physiology of entrepreneurs is very different than mere mortals. And I'm not trying to downplay mere mortals, but the adrenaline, the risk taking and the absolute unwavering emotional belief and passion and what you are doing is what separates entrepreneurs from regular bureaucrats. Is that a shitty thing to say? Like, I mean, I really no, I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's an important thing to say. It's a good segue to us taking a dive into hell. Um, because I think what I did as a young entrepreneur uh, and, you know, I started when I was 25, I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur, basically I just couldn't get a job and didn't want to sit in a desk and, Entrepreneurship wasn't a thing in 1999 the way it is now, but but it was a path. And and in the beginning, like I think a lot of things in life, you try and justify your choice by making the other choices wrong. Mm -hmm. And I did that. Like I was guilty of it. Like I, God bless anyone who took my phone call and my family or gosh, that was around me for the first seven years I was trying to build, you know, stuff. I was an ass. I mean, I, I like literally was like, you want a job? You're a loser. You suck. You're never going to get rich. Yeah. I projected my own uncertainty of whether or not I was really going to be able to do this on others by making them wrong. So I, I understand why you're couching the whole mere mortals thing. I think I know what you mean. And for those listening to this, it's not a knock. It's just a recognition of there's different people and that both people are required for society and humanity to work. But the reality is the vital few have always impacted and led the trivial many. And that does not mean that the many are less than or worth less from a humanitarian standpoint. It means that they're different in their DNA and what they're willing to do with their life. Some people are totally fine and will not want a life that doesn't exist uh, inside a nine to five. Because they choose to experience this life around the sun differently and they get joy out of different things. They like to mow their lawn. They like to do whatever they like to do. Happiness is the outcome. Self-awareness is, as a lot of, you know, Gary and, and some of the other thought leaders out there are starting to promote, I think is the outcome everyone should want. And you're just self-aware that, like me, like others, you're different in this way. It doesn't make it better. It just makes it, you make more aware of who you are. Yeah. And I think to that point, Chris, just to kind of like, I'm not trying to be the great equalizer and pacifier here, but it doesn't matter what you do, whether you are working for a Fortune 500 company, if you are corporate, if you are in finance, you as a human being can benefit by knowing more about the entrepreneurial process. It will make you better at everything you do in life. You can be a leader at a big giant company and be an entrepreneurial thinker. You can be, so it gets into the softer sciences a little bit, but there, there is not anyone on this planet who stands to lose anything by knowing more about entrepreneurship. And I, I deeply, deeply believe that even politicians. I mean, I think we can all agree on that right now. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, and I think that's where what you've done as a member of the media and, and what other people in the media do to elevate it is healthy. The unhealthy side is 
where is the landing place for those who on the back end of, of their first failure don't really have or want to do what it takes to be this way? Where do we where do we leave them when when the only thing they see is Zuck and Elon or, you know, the average Joe? Where do we leave them when the only thing they see is the crypto billionaire who bought Bitcoin early and either got lucky or whatever and them being left behind? That's the point of this, right, is that we're we're serving a, a group of entrepreneurs that, quite frankly, maybe they even think some of their businesses is, is not sexy and, and they have squirrel syndrome because it's just clipping along, making money and it's stable and it's not as challenging as it once was. You know, there's there's so many things that we do that we have to feed that drama hook, that that risk side of, of the DNA. And sometimes we do it in our business and we screw up what's working. So, you know, sometimes it gets ripped away from us or things get ripped away from us that were outside of our control. So what was what was a time in your life could be early on, could be recently that that you're willing to you know share that is like you just got your teeth kicked in, like everything that could have gone wrong or everything that you thought mattered to you got ripped away from you. And you, quite frankly, whether you described it as being depressed or or not, you were like, holy crap, like what? Tell, tell us a moment where you just hit what we would call the low. You know, it, it is a fair question. And, you know, I had some lows in my career. You know, one of them was just being naive, going into leading a team of 80 editors and reporters at Entrepreneur, thinking that because I was coming in and creating change and innovating and disrupting, they would follow me. That is horse pucky. They hated me from the moment I walked in. Um, I had all these plans for creating this this great thing. So it, it that took a little getting used to. But the the biggest, most defining moment in my life was when I was on a motorcycle in Santa Fe and I got a reverse 911 call from the sheriff in Larimer County, where I live in Colorado. The, there was a fast moving forest fire and it came and I could not evacuate any of my possessions or anything. And the house burned to the ground along with 256 other houses as well. You know, it was just one of those moments where it, you really do understand that the stuff part of life. And we dug, my husband and I dug and dug looking for any sort of shrapnel from our old life. And there, there was nothing there. And there's a point at which you have to stand up and dust off the ashes and move on. And it's a lot like, you know, failing in a business. You you cannot dig in the rubble. You have got to move on. You know, that that was a very powerful lesson. And we rebuilt, like the story has a happy end. The horses are fun. Like, you know, it could have been so much worse, but it was a, that was a lesson that will define me forever. Like, do you dig around in the rubble or do you get up and start over? The question to me is pretty obvious. What were some of the impacts of that? I mean, obviously losing losing every material thing and and maybe memory that you had stored up in a place is, is uh, devastating. I mean, that like, there's a point at which you have to accept it, but you know, you didn't accept it right away. I mean, there had to have been some kind of transition between the shock of it. And then, you know, the, the holding on to things you couldn't hold on to anymore. Like tell, tell us a little bit. And the only reason I say that is because the fire, is is a real thing to happen to you but it's it's a great metaphor for so many things and and i just i, I just want to see what what other people could glean from like how did you get through it like what do you remember do you remember certain things or did you just repress it all and now you look back and you're like no it was no big deal like you yeah, know no, like, no i remember every every moment of that 24 hour period of time but there the the moment came when i was digging with my, the, the Red Cross gave us, you know, stuff. They gave us a, a, a chemical mask and gloves and a shovel and a sieve to go through things. And I remember just, you know, there was a moment where I was like, this, it's over. There's nothing left here. We cannot keep digging like this for days in these masks, looking like idiots, covered in soot, you know, and not make a decision on how to move forward. And so it was at that moment both of us and my husband is an entrepreneur as well. So we, you know, we kind of have the same philosophy that we decided we were going to rebuild our house. We were just going to make it work. And, um, and we did. And that's, I mean, we just had this extreme focus after we were able to get up out of the pit where our house used to be. What are examples, whether they were things you witnessed or, or related to this, that you've seen 
when things like this happen or when this happened to you, were there collateral damages that extended beyond the initial loss that were unfortunate and that, you know, you learned something from maybe, maybe it's, you know, I don't want to call it a regret because maybe it's not a regret, but everybody, you know, has different things. I, I just, you know, sometimes relationships get changed. I think about when businesses shut down, you know, it's like when they face their metaphorical fire, you know, it typically means relationships are let go because either you have to tell somebody they're no longer employed or payroll isn't going to be made or, you know, they got to like, you can't help them anymore. And as a, as an entrepreneur that, you know, that takes you to a different place because as scary as it is to be on the receiving end of bad news, like your house is gone or your job is gone because your company is no longer in existence. When you sit at the helm of it, as a, an entrepreneur, you're responsible for more than just your life. You're responsible for other people's lives. And and you've traded your credibility and you've traded your belief and you've traded you've traded your confidence, right, for that. And it didn't work. You know, there's all these things that so I'm just curious, did you have you any thoughts on that? Like any lessons learned from your own or from watching others kind of navigate from one fire to the next, you know, build that you think are insightful? of how they got through it. Yeah. I mean, I think that is a really profound question. And, you know, the, the people who, who I have seen and interviewed who've been through failure and most entrepreneurs have been through a couple of failures. It really is a matter of character, right? Like you as a leader have got to be the one who stands strong and inspires people, even during times of duress, whether it's a fire or layoffs or complete and total shutdown um, of a company. Like you as a leader have to do, like that is your job. You have to be the one who imparts bad news or creates some kind of inspiring message. And then at the end of the day, and I've been there, like at the end of the day, if you still are feeling guilty and remorseful and yucky, you need to go talk to someone, right? Like you're not- You know, that's the one. So I agree with you and then- you know, I, I know I've felt this way. I don't know if anybody else has, but that's easier said than done. I know, I know. And and it's and, and I say that with the, the caveat that there's several reasons. One could be too pride, too proud, not 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 mentally evolved enough to realize that everyone can ask for help. There, there's like the awareness of like you can and should. Some people don't have that. So for those who don't know that you can and should ask for help when it's when the guilt is that thick or when whatever, you can and you should. Okay, but the other side of that is where it also gets difficult. I know plenty of times in my life where I, because I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of people over the years, right? Counselors, all kinds of things, right? You know, you you, you kind of just treat that as part of your athletic training, you know, metaphor. Right. Right? You got to tape up, you got to take care of yourself to stay in the game. But there are, there are real challenges, I think, for entrepreneurs, or at least I've faced them sometimes with, how do you get what you need to get over that hump that you can't get over on your own as mentally strong as you may be or have become? Right. And when everything is contingent on the next, meaning your integrity is intact, you do not want to violate that, but you can't tell the one person that may be closest to you that is a customer or core thing because you may scare them off. And if they go away, then like you can't save anything. And, you know, like, and then, oh, well, what do I tell? Oh, that person doesn't know because they have right. a job or they, they don't live this life. Well. So they're going to, they're going to love on me. They're going to tell me, but they don't understand the dynamics I'm dealing with. They don't have empathy around. They, they can sympathize or empathize with me, but they can't sympathize with me because they don't have the context that I have around why these moving parts all work in a certain way because they don't, they don't build life this way. And so like you, sometimes it's really freaking lonely. It is. And honestly, like it's not their problem. It's your problem. Right. You need to be the one who seeks out, like you need to be the one coming from a position of strength, seeking help, professional help, or, you know, there's a ton of stuff online, but really, and it's just one more thing that goes on the shoulders of entrepreneurs is that you're, you're responsible for your own mental health and your own happiness right? Like it's just that. And I, you know, Chris, I am not a psychologist and, but I think this is a very, very important topic and something that you should continue, you know, talking about, like, it's very, very important. So let's, let's transition. So we, we talked about, you know, some of the lows and we can weave back in, but, you know, finding the calm and I call it finding the calm because some of the bad advice that you will hear from people <laughs> 
that when you when you reach out for help may sound like, well, you know, why don't you go do something else? Or right. if you would just slow down, if you would just slow down, you know, then da da da. It doesn't and, work that way. Yeah. And it doesn't work that way. And so what I've learned over the years is that it's not about slowing down, it's about calming down so you can speed up. Because the world doesn't wait. And and I say this, and I hope I don't offend you in this, but I know you're a Gen X, so you probably won't be offended. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is, is when your house burnt to the ground, no one really gave a shit. Now, caveat, people showed concern, people felt bad for you, but it wasn't their problem. That's right. If their house didn't burn down. So the only people that really cared were the 254 or whatever it was, other people that lived in and around you that all had a shared problem. We're trying to figure out how to support one another through it and rebuild that community if, if it was possible. So I'm not saying no one cared. What I'm saying is the world kept going. Like the five o'clock news yeah. still happened that night. Yeah. And you were just the lead in story because if it bleeds, it leads. But the minute that there was another story that mattered, you no one worried about the fires in Risk Canyon anymore. No, people, and, and that's fine. And they shouldn't, you know, like. And, and that's right. And so my point is, is that calming down is about realizing that we are, we matter, but we're insignificant, as weird as that may sound. Right. We, we matter, but we are responsible for our own destiny. And, you know, I, 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 I know this about you. Like, you are not someone to make a victim out of yourself. And I'm not someone to make a victim out of. Like, I just, I, I prefer to just dust it off and move on and do something great, you know, right around the corner. But always taking that time, like what you're talking about with the self-care, you know, like, you can make yourself into a factor of curiosity and you don't, you don't want to do that. Like you want to make sure that you are talking to professionals. Again, I am not one of those, but I have written about this topic. Don't make your pain and your burden, the burden of those around you and your customers and your employees, you know, you need to take care of that yourself. And that's like a Navy SEAL training thing. Yeah. You know, I like the Navy SEAL advice for entrepreneurs most of the time, some of it is a little too hard ass, um, but it's overall, they, and they, you know, they all have to go see professionals when they get out of service. But anyway, I'm just putting, I don't know why I'm putting it out there, Chris, but there you have it. Yeah, no, I think, um, so we, we'd love to, you know, say when you, when it comes to how Amy finds the calm, what are some of the things that you do when, mm -hmm. like when you're not feeling the entrepreneur Ducati riding person, when you doubt whether you can still hold the wheel, when you doubt whether or not people should listen to you. And then maybe it doesn't happen that often, but whenever you're not in a place where you're, where you're really you, where you're stepping in, what are the things you do that, that help you find that calm and realize that the highs and the lows, you know, the roller coaster isn't, isn't to be ridden. It's just, it's just something to be recognized and that you have to kind of, you know, stay on this, this kind of common vector of up and to the right, but in a steady pace, like, what do you do? Do you go sit in the woods? Do you ski? Do you ride Ducatis? What do you do? Well, I do a lot of skiing and I do, I meditate a lot. I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, but the, the one thing that gives me a lot of, a lot of peace is reading. And when I say reading, I mean, non-business books, books that have nothing to do with anything related to starting or standing up a business, like pick up a history book, pick up a fiction book, like let your mind go somewhere that is not related. Don't, don't read Malcolm Gladwell books, right? Like if you're stressed <laughs> out, like pick up a nice history book, a book about horses, a book about something that you care about. Don't, when you, when you immerse yourself in too much business, you lose a part of who you are. And I, I really believe that I don't, even though I write business books, I do not read them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Sorry to knock them back. It's, you know, it's it's a really interesting point. So if you have a favorite book that that you've read recently that's not a business book that that helps you kind of reset yourself, mm -hmm. feel free to plug it and we'll give that author uh, some love today. You know, I I sometimes color um, huh? with with my son because just the act of coloring, you know, cartoons in a coloring book takes your brain to a different Absolutely. place, even though it's, you know, and I play the drums. So the, the point is, is you do something that activates the other side of your brain and yeah. and yet just takes you away from it all. What what's what's a good book that you've read that's not a business book? Here's my here's my theory on business books. If you are an entrepreneur and all you do is read business books, like, you know, the path to glory or the whatever, whatever, that's like eating a diet of one food, right? Your brain needs multiple kinds of foods. You can't live on 
you know, beef alone, you, you need to spread out your diet. And so the book that I read most recently is a book called Sapiens, which is a New York Times bestseller. It's an old yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. Oh my God. It really, not only did I get lost in this book, but it really helped to reset some of my brain cells so that I could, you know, be better at, you know, stuff I was writing and just to step away a little bit from the whole idea of ecosystems and start like, let your brain go somewhere else. It, it will, it will do you good. Yeah, Sapiens is a great book, and uh, and I I recently re- um, I'm not finished it yet, but I I read Simulated Hypothesis, which is um, yeah. which is a phenomenal brain twist of how this is all just one big video game. But but, uh, <laughs> but beyond beyond just saying it, like it actually is pretty pretty uh, interesting. So um, cool. So so a couple things that we can take away from from what I heard you say. One of them is is where where you look is where you're going. Yep. The other one that we heard about is you know, essentially taking, taking your brain, you know, don't, don't eat a diet of one food as, as, as much as that is. And, you know, even as the purveyor of shirts that say hustle and grind and everything (laughs) in between, part of that is the reminder that 24, seven, 365 may be how you feel when, when you're passionate about something, whether it's raising your kids or whether you're just living a life, it's just a reminder that every day you're living 24, seven, 365 and you should and could apply that to whatever it is you care most about and and realize that, you know, everything has a cost, but it doesn't mean you have to pay costs you don't value. It just means you have to be willing to pay the cost for the things you do value. And sometimes that means shutting it off, Yeah, you know, and, and so that's another takeaway. As it relates to increasing the dosage for you in, in the final minute here, um, where can people best find you if you want to be found? What is it that this community can do specifically for Amy Cosper, Radical Upstarts, uh, whatever it is that you're currently focused on to support you? What is it that is valuable and supportive of you and your initiatives as we finish up this show? Well, that's very nice. I think just in concluding with your earlier your earlier point, one, one thing that um, entrepreneurs really need to do is give themselves a break sometime, like just give yourself a break, turn it off. I know that people are going a million miles a minute, but like, just give yourself some time. And um, you can reach me anywhere. You can reach me at Amy at at radicalupstarts.com on LinkedIn, on Facebook. I'm on Twitter at Amy C. Cosper. And um, my website is amycosper.com. So, and I'm looking for stories. Anyone who has a great story, I'm looking for it. Awesome. Well, there you have it. That now, now your inbox is going to be like <laughs> broken. All right. Well, Amy Cosper, thank you so much for joining us here on Increase the Dosage. You know where to find her. It'll also be in the show notes. And we will see you next week for another episode. Thank you very much, Amy. Thanks, Chris. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of Increase the Dosage. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned, as well as a few quotes for sharing on social media, head on over to increasethedosage.show. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Startup Drugs. That's drugs with a Z. Have an amazing week.